I'm going to show you how I approached getting a mix that I think is a pretty rad sounding modern pop punk tune. So let's jump into Studio One and let's do that thing. <coughs> all right, here is my song. You see, this is pretty much all of the audio tracks that uh, are necessary for, for what I've created. This is how I work. So I work in Studio One. I enjoy it quite a bit. And if you're looking for a new DAW, Studio One is great. To start off, uh, once I've kind of got everything written and recorded in and I want to start mixing, I'll usually start with the drums. Now, not always, sometimes I start with the vocal, but it'll either be the vocal or the drums, one or the two, depending on the vibe of the song. This song, I decided to start with the drums. Now, to get the drums, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a fresh little taste. They sound pretty good, right? They sound Pretty rad, I think. Now, to be completely honest with you and to not try to pretend like it's anything other, I use Superior 3 and I use the Pop Punk sample pack for, for Superior 3, which is a drum kit that was uh, made by John Feldman with uh, Travis Barker's kit and a few other kits and recorded by some genius engineers who just made a, a just a crazy, crazy drum sample pack. So I use basically the Pop Punk preset. Okay, and then I change the snare around because I don't like the pop punk snare. I like the SJC snare I think I'm using. Yeah, I'm using this 7x14 uh, SJC aluminum snare. And to be completely, to be completely legit with you, I pretty much use it as is, right? I know, I know, I know, presets, but it sounds really good and I don't have to spend a whole lot of time figuring things out. I don't use this for every song, but I do use this specific setup for quite a few songs because it has the vibe that I'm frequently going for with my music. And I feel like time not wasted figuring out a bunch of stuff is time better spent on actually creating music. So that's my thing. You can blast me down in the comments if you want for using a preset, but that's what I do. So if you have some good drum samples, you're set. If you have to mix drums, well, you know, there's tons and tons of videos on the internet about how to do it. And honestly, you know, just some compression Right, it looks like that's mostly all it is. This is just, it's got a bunch of questions. I would show you what it is, but unfortunately they don't want you to know. It's this thing called black box and it's just a compressor of some sort and you can't actually see what it's doing under the hood. So that's why I like it because I don't want to try to figure out how to reproduce it when it's already done. So there you go. That's how I do drums, whatever. But once I've got the drums kind of sounding good, I will bring in guitars frequently next. So the guitars for this song, let me just get a nice... I don't like to go crazy with a lot of stuff. To get the sound of the guitars, in this song I'm just hard panning two guitars left and right for a lot of it, uh, at least for kind of the big moments, and then I will bring in extra guitars here and there as needed. My main sounds are this uh, uh, this Marshall style amp that I've got over on the left hand side with a little bit of a tube screamer. Uh, it's just kind of my go to my go to sound. I really, really like it. You know, it's very it's a Marshall sound, super mid rangey, but I love it. It's kind of my my starting point for most guitars. And then the right guitar is a Vox style amp here that I've got going. This one I'm actually pushing it a little bit more than I normally would, just to get a little bit more dirt on it. <laughs> I like it because it's a little boxy um, and it's 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 got that kind of that same kind of like upper mid range sound that I think sounds good. Well, I fiddled around with stuff for a while and this is what I got that sounded good. So that's kind of my approach. You'll see frequently when I'm when I'm doing these things, I use a Marshall and a Vox to kind of get my 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 basic guitar tones. And if we look at my uh, my my guitar bus right here, I effectively just have it running through a fat channel, which is. Um, just a bit of a gate that I don't use. It's a, a little bit of a low pass filter. We got some compression going on and we've got an EQ. The compressor is just doing a little, it's just kind of touching the top just to hold the hold some of the, the big sparkly frequencies in so that it doesn't get too crazy. Um, not doing anything too mad. Low pass around uh, just, just under 200 of just tiny, tiny bit of compression, a little bit of high end added in and then some mid range taken out just to make it a little more sparkly. And then I've got it running through a reverb. Um, I use just like a small room reverb for my guitars. It's just this small room. Um, 
yeah, it's a small room. I really like it. I think it's called Studio, Medium Studio. And then I always, 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 always EQ the low end out of my reverb so that it doesn't get a bunch of low end buildup. Pretty common thing for me. Now that I have the guitars in and sitting at a pretty reasonable place for most of the song, you can see some examples. What I would have done going through the song is finding sections where, so for example, the guitars are playing different things here. I would have balanced all those out before I reamped them. So I would have recorded it in and I would have adjusted the clip volume for each section so that they were about even um, or in a way that I wanted them balanced and then reamped them through, which is what you're seeing now. This is the reamped the reamped tracks, putting the time in and getting your clips gained properly before doing mixing and reamping and stuff like that is, is smart because then it just saves you having to do a lot of automation moves later. And the less work I have to do later, the, the better. So yeah, so I got them balanced to a good spot. When I would have recording it in, the guitar on the right hand side probably would have been probably would have been a little quieter because it's like a, just a softer guitar part. Um, but then getting them balanced and amped out properly so everything's a good volume means that I have less work that I have to do later, and then I can focus more on bringing elements in and out and having them move around in the frequency ranges to to make things stand out a little bit better. Once I've got that, I'll bring in the bass. Now for bass. I'm using this Rad Contact uh, plugin called Punk Bass by Submission Audio. It is so rad. It sounds unreal. This is like, this is the P-Bass sound through an Ampeg that you love. Sometimes I'll record out the DI version of it and then use uh, uh, some stereo widthening to kind of spice things up a bit. But I think for this song specifically, I just went with um, just the sound of the bass as it is because I wanted that kind of pop punk, that pop punk tone of this like biting, biting punk rock bass that just cuts right through. Very, very Blink-182 inspired in this approach. I definitely used the song Dumpweed a little bit when I was referencing for the mix uh, to get a similar-ish balance. Obviously not trying to create that song, but that was one of the inspirations. Uh, for the bass, I still have, and I have it running through here, and there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a chorus on the low end that I, this is a trick that I really like to use where I'll I'll just scoop out the, uh, all of the high end and leave just the low end and then I'll run it through a chorus and that just mix it in to add a little bit of width to the bass to make it take up a bunch more space. Uh, it's a trick that I'm that I like to use a lot on the bass. I'll frequently I'll just like everything I'll high pass out some stuff that doesn't get used. Just a small amount of compression, probably just to rein in some of the high frequencies and then added a, a fair amount of high end to the bass just to make it po poke out even more um, because everything could probably use a little bit more high end. So then when I put those all together, Yeah, and that's that's a, a big part of the song is those those three things together, the two guitars, the bass, and the drums being written in a way that they, they fit sonically together really, really well. I put a lot of focus into that when I'm in the writing stages to save me time later. Now there's a little section right here in the verse where I switch things up a little bit, where I use kind of this really trashy drum sound. I just automated the trash mic in this in Superior and printed it down by itself to be just this really trashy, really small sound, really, really mid-rangey. And it's on a separate track because I did some EQing to it. I think a little bit of extra EQing on the back end just to get it to sound exactly like I wanted. Yeah, you can see right here, there's a bit of an EQ going on. Mostly, uh, I think my brother got actually did this for me. Uh, just to get to sound a little bit better. Then I have here, just to switch things up a little bit, this is just the guitars playing um, just chords, just the chords only. It's just to go from this kind of like big moment to like a really small moment. And then there's a, there's like a, a mid rangey vocal. <laughs> It's meant to be a really small moment. What do you get when you cross? 
So we go in kind of from this really large moment with all these instruments and everything smashing and being really full to this really small, tight moment where everything's really small sounding and very mid rangey. Um, so that when we come out of that moment, we get this. Lost. And everything comes kicking back in at full volume. Uh, just the dynamic range thing to try to make things seem more exciting and make things hit harder. You go from big to small, small to big, and it, it makes more dynamic excitement. It's a, something that I'm a big fan of. As we work our way through, uh, during just the intro, I added a couple really bad sounding guitars to reinforce the bass. I think they sound really bad uh, using triple a triple rectifier sound just to try to get this kind of like grungy thing so that it mixes in with the bass. The only reason it's there is just to make the bass a little spikier. That's it, and it only happens in that one spot. I didn't even repeat it again in the song. It just wanted a little bit more for when for when everything kicked in at the beginning. As we move through, I have a few um, of these, what I call X guitars, and they're just kind of reinforcement guitars. Oh, that's, this is a, 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 a lot, this is just like a little, a little, a little idea motif that happens. Crazy just to add some excitement into the little like mini breakdowns that I put in the in the pre-courses there's nothing special i even left some of the some of the buzzing and the string noise in there which is you know probably not the best in the world but eh, what are you going to do looking at these i'm pretty much just using these marshall amp uh, with a bit of a bit of high end gain on it nothing too crazy to speak of in terms of that it looks like on both sides it's the exact same sound, just like a marshall -y thing playing some higher notes, just to stand out a little bit. And, I, and I've got it just panned just slightly off to either side so that it's still there, but not, not doing too much. Those repeat again later, but they only happen kind of in this, in this uh, the one pre-chorus kind of spot. So it's nothing really to write home about. Then I've got this section with a lead guitar. <laughs> Yeah, the guitar is the same thing that Marshall, I, re I really like the Marshall for a lot of things and it, it seems to just kind of work in this song. There's a bit of a phaser on here. This is not active right now, but uh, cause I printed it down, but this is a phaser to kind of give that weird kind of like TV effect. And then when everything kind of kicks in, I decided to give it some delay. <laughs> Big fan of putting delay on lead guitars just to make them seem a lot larger, like they take up a bunch more space. And then in terms of what I'm doing to the bus, not a lot. I've actually pulled out some high end and pushed some low mids to make it peak out a little bit more. Uh, and then just a few dB of compression. Again, I just use compression mostly to rein in wayward transients and stuff like that with most instruments. I don't get too heavy handed with compression on instruments for the most part. But yeah, that's that's it. There's nothing too crazy with the lead guitar. My major thing is always when I'm writing to try to get things to fit together as it is before I record anything down and get into the mix stages. So I don't have to do a lot of crazy EQ moves to get stuff to fit. Um, that all kind of fits together like this. I think that fits together pretty well. It's kind of an interesting thing. You've got the really staccato chuggy chugs and then this like really high flying guitar thing happening with a lot of delay that kind of drags it out and makes it, it gives it a, a bit more width to it, which, which is kind of fun. Once we've got all that stuff in, I will always add a few little extras, some accoutrements, if you will. Um, I like piano. I think it's a fantastic instrument and I love to put it in a bit of everything. It's just to enforce some melodic notes. The likelihood is I haven't done nearly anything to the piano. It looks like just a little bit of high end. And the compressor is on, but it's not really doing anything. And then a uh, high, pass, high pass filter to cut out some stuff that's not important. Uh, that piano is running through a delay. I do that all the time with my pianos. Instead of running them through reverbs, I prefer to run a piano through delay. I just think it sounds cooler and um, decays in an interesting way. It's just one of my 
one of my tricks. You can see this is the piano delay that I'll use. It's just a quarter note delay, nothing too insane. And then I'll have the direct signal of the piano with a delay on it. And then I will run the an aux send that has an additional reverb on it just to add a bit more space, which you can see right here. Uh, for some reason, I haven't EQ'd this, which is not normal for me. Uh, usually I EQ that stuff, but anyway, you get, you get, you get an idea. That's pretty much it. Um, yeah, piano fits in pretty well, especially when I'm using it just as an accenting instrument. I'm not using it to do, to do much more than, than make a few ideas stick out. And then a few other tasty little things. I've got this little synth that I, that I, that I added. It's just a bit compressed synth, nothing spectacular, just like an FM synth that I put bit, bit crusher on. Um, cause I was going for a vibe for this song and I wanted kind of these like moments of bit crushing to be happening throughout the course of the song as you lead up to kind of this, this, this end section for this one, I used this pre plugin called crush. And this is the settings that I use just to try to make it sound a little bit like a distorted breaking apart, uh, thingamajigger. That synth only happens in this one moment. Um, it never repeats. It is a one time only thing that comes in here. <laughs> And then I've just automated it to kind of swell in up behind the guitars and get louder as the as the the weird moment comes to a conclusion. I like to do things like that. I like to put things in that only happen once because it just creates audible textures that catch the ear and catch the imagination of whoever's listening and then never come back again. So they have to listen again if they want to catch all the stuff hidden in the song. And then coming down to the end here, we've got, I added some strings, nothing crazy on strings. Uh, one is a harmony, a legato harmony. <laughs> nothing crazy, just a reverb out string. I probably didn't even EQ it. It's probably just the sound that it is. And then these cello stabs. <laughs> And those are there just to reinforce this staccato moment that's happening. That's it. It's just to add a little bit of a little bit of texture as the last chorus comes in, just to make it sound interesting. Which again, I like to just add things in when I can. Uh, I felt like it fit. Then we have the vocals. So once I've got all the instruments in a pretty good place um, that I'm happy with, I will come and start working on vocals. Now, when we get into vocal world, I do a lot of the same thing that I said with the guitars, where I will sit and meticulously, when comping, uh, go through and make sure that I've balanced out everything. So if I'm singing a softer part, I'll increase the volume. If I'm singing a louder part, I'll decrease it. Uh, as you can see, I've made a few adjustments here, even as uh, after I printed everything down because it needed to be done. Obviously, there was some stuff, some some S's probably and some breaths that just needed to be turned down, what have you. But I'm a big fan of spending a bit of time up front comping your vocals in a way and balancing them so that you don't even need a compressor engaged for them to be the correct volume to sit on the track. And then you know if the if the performance sounds good and then you start doing things like effects. Now for this song, I did a main vocal, which is kind of the, the verse vocal, which is in the center. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens. Now I've gotten pretty heavy handed with this. I, I know I said I don't get too heavy handed with uh, with instruments when it comes to EQ and compression. When it comes to vocals, I do. I, I get I get really, really heavy handed and I do a lot to them because I think that it, that's the instrument that really, really needs it. You know, I, I do get pretty crazy. Now I'm using, uh, I'm in an untreated room using just kind of whatever microphones, um, inexpensive microphones. So I do have to do a fair amount of work. Um, right out of the gate, I am pulling a bad frequency out I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens. This just to rein in some of the uh, the higher harsh S frequencies because that's the thing that I struggle with when I'm when I'm working on my own voice, um, the way I, the way I sing and stuff like that. Um, very very sibilant voice I know that I have. Then I will come in and I will do kind of my big moves. I'll cut a lot of low end out, which you should just get rid of the low end. It's just taking up space and it's it's getting things muddied. And then I hit the compressor pretty hard. I must confess that I'm... You see, it's pretty, pretty belligerent. I must confess that I'm 
Spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Now I do this to try to add a bit more uh, energy to the, to the performance. This is a common thing where you just hit the voice really hard, really aggressively. So fast attack, fast release, hitting it really hard with a lot of dB of gain reduction. Now I know some people will say that you, you're supposed to use multiple compressors and stuff like that. Ah, to heck with it. I like the way that this sounds and it works for my voice and that's the most important thing. So you can copy my settings. I don't know if there's any point to copying my settings because this is just what works on my voice in this one specific song, but this is kind of my baseline as I'll go all buttons in on a, on a FET style compressor and I'll hit it really, really hard, really fast and um, try to make it pump just, just a little bit to bring out some of, the, some of the gross stuff in my throat. I need some high end for sure. Um, this, this frequency range in my voice right here is tricky, so. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens. And I think it just makes my voice sound a little flatter and a little nicer with all this stuff pulled out when I think subtractive EQing is important, just as, just as additive EQing. And then I'll, I'll hit a limiter to catch some of the, uh, the higher frequencies and the S's and stuff. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time. Just reins things in a little bit, which I think is necessary. Uh, then I hit a de -esser pretty pretty hard. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Again, I have a very sibilant voice, so this is just something I have to do with my songs. I need to DS my voice like crazy to, to rein that stuff in. It just is what it is. And then I do a little bit of extra EQing at the end just to like get a couple of treble frequencies. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Not the best. Just tidying up some of the low mids in my voice um, just to make them fit a little bit better in the overall mix. Um, now, I would mostly be doing these these moves and making all these changes while listening to the entire song. I don't do a ton of soloing unless I'm really trying to go after a frequency. Uh, so I would be doing this in relation to the entire song. I wouldn't just be focusing solely on the vocal necessarily. And that's, and that's it for how I would process the vocals initially. Now, I in this song and frequently for the center vocal that usually does the verses, I like to use a double. I must confess that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens and my eyesight's not the best. I've processed this in the same way um, and then just mixed it in a little underneath. The difference is that I will have hit the compressor for the S's even harder to really scoop those S's down so that they don't get in the way of the main vocal so that there's none of that weird, like the S's being off. Or I'll even go in so far as to, as you see right here, there's like an S or a breath and I'll get, I'll just cut it out entirely so that they're, they're just not getting in the way at all. And there's none of these like off center breaths and stuff like that. So I'm not afraid to edit crap out if I don't like it and cut and adjust and change volumes on S's and breaths and stuff like that to make them fit better in the song. Um, but doubling is pretty good. I don't go so crazy as to comp my doubles to be like perfectly tight. I don't use like vocal line or anything, or at least I haven't because I don't have it. Um, because I personally like to leave a little bit of humanity in there. I think because of the kind of music that I'm making, it's okay to leave a little bit of that rawness and a little bit of, I don't want to say mistakes, but a little bit of humanity in there. So I don't like everything to be like locked in perfect tight. If we were to listen to that with and without the double, we'll put in all the instruments so you can get an, ex an idea of. See, I'm not even doing anything that's a like crazy noticeable when you're hearing it in the context of the mix, but it is there to kind of just add a little bit of interestingness to the voice and make it sound a little beefier. That's just, uh, that's just all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to make the, my voice sound beefy and trying to make my voice sound good because I'm an ego monster. Uh, and then what I'll do for choruses in almost every case is I will double track my choruses and I will pan them just slightly off left and right. Now, in this case, um, I'm about... Mm, not quite halfway left and right. Weird times, weird times, weird times with you. I've processed these almost the exact same way as the other ones because once I get a, a, a voice that sounds good, I think that I'm pretty pretty happy with it, even though it's a little different in the register. But usually I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll tweak things if I need to later. I think it looks like the uh, EQ curve is just a little bit different uh, on this fix up EQ at the end. But I like to have this little widening effect of having the same thing being sung twice. They're slightly out of tune with each other, slightly out of time with each other because it's a different performance and it kind of just adds this, this width. Weird 
Weird times, weird times. And that's pretty much how I would do almost every chorus for my main vocal take. Um, then I start getting into the sauce and the sauce for, for vocals for me is tons, so much sauce, it's crazy. So what I'll do is I'll set up a series of sends and I like to get pretty, pretty wacky with it and uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean. I'll start off with a small room that I'll push stuff into. This is a small studio space which gives kind of this like tight reverb that I like. That I'm spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Then I've got kind of this really long reverb. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time. So this is a pretty long, pretty long reverb to take up a lot of space. Then I'll create a short delay. This is just like a little 16th note delay to, to, to kind of make a little slap. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time. Of course, again, just to thicken up the voice a little bit. Then I'll create a long delay that I'll use as a throw, but also just kind of have in the background all the time. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time staring at screen. I love quarter note delays. I think they're fantastic, and I, they add a lot of a lot of depth and texture to songs. Um, so that's something that I'll use, and I'll kind of have all of these going in the background at all times. And then the last thing that I'll do for for my vocals, especially for the uh, the center lead vocal, is I will create a thickening send, which is just a chorus. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens and my eyesight's not the best. And I'll just dial it into taste, just to thicken up the voice a little bit to make it sound kind of nice and take up a lot of space. And then when I put all of those together. You basically get this. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Yes, that I'm spending most of my time staring at screens at my eyesight. Stuff that you can't even necessarily hear, but is there happening in the background, just taking up some space, making some texture, and the delays are causing all sorts of like weird, wacky stuff going on in the background. And I like it. It just it just makes my voice sound a little cooler. And so that's kind of my effect when it comes to comes to doing my lead vocal. And I'll put that on all of the lead vocals, and those will just be kind of happening. And then we get the harmony vocals. Um, with the harmonies, same as before, I'll go through, I'll track everything and I'll balance everything out so it's in a pretty good spot, turn some stuff up, turn some stuff down. I like to do you know, a fair amount of work on harmonies. Um, I, I love harmonies, honestly. I think that they're just so much fun. But as you can see, everything's pretty well balanced here in terms of the harmonies volume. There's a couple spots here or there that I turn some stuff up or whatever. For processing, still hitting the vocals pretty hard with compression. Um, just a little bit of scooping out some frequencies that didn't sound too good. I must confess that I am. Yeah, just really hitting it really hard. Um, but my heart drive crash, that's just my luck. And I'm trying to keep up, but my heart drive crash. You know, um, it's a lot of singing in really high voices and stuff like that. So I scoop out a lot of the low end. As you can see, there's a ton of low end pulled out of this specific one. As you can see on this one, I've, I've pulled out not anywhere near as much of the low end um, as it's a more low end voice, but just to make stuff fit. And then what I'll do is once I get everything balanced, I pretty much send all of my harmonies to just one long reverb that I like. Um, and then I'll really send it in there for some of those harmonies so they take up some like really far away space because they just kind of come in and out as necessary. As you can see, there's lots of them. So let me give you a cool example of kind of at the end when I've got everything going. This is also, I think, just the same. This is a warm plate. So it's a slightly different plate than the lead vocal just to add a little bit of a little bit of depth, but you can hear it as soon as I play it, you'll, you'll hear it. And then I'm hitting everything in the harmony vox pretty hard with some DSing because that's a major, major, major thing for me is not only do I have a very sibilant voice, but then when you've got a bunch of voices happening all at once like this, weird times, weird times. you don't want the S's to get in the way and build up and get in the way of your main vocal, which on top of it is also singing the same, the same bit, right? So all the S's in the main vocal are going to be there. Weird times, weird times, weird times. Weird times, weird times. 
So there's a lot of S's already in the main vocal, so I like to just crush the S's, if at all possible, entirely out of the harmonies so that you just can't hear them at all, and then they just don't ever get in the way. Now you could go and you could cut these out when you're comping and stuff, but I don't want them entirely gone, but I want them to be not really noticeable at all. That's basically it in terms of how I would go for the main mix to get everything balanced pretty well. And when you listen to it all kind of at the end, So there you go, and that's kind of everything when it's all together. I think that sounds pretty cool. And then the last kind of cool moment is I created this kind of like loud, distorted delay throw. Just to kind of add to this bit crushed thing that's kind of happening throughout. And to do that, it's a delay, like you can see right here, an eighth note delay that's being run through a bit crusher and then out to a, a weird room reverb plate that I thought sounded cool. And it's just to kind of create something unique and individual and different. I'll do that with delays sometimes. I'll create like weird delay effects that happen only one time in the song. Again, because I like to use things that only happen maybe once in a song that's just add a little bit of difference. And then the final big moment that I'm most excited about in this song is this section right here. <laughs> And this is really simply, I just, to make it seem like the hard drive is actually crashing, because that's like the sec section of the song is talking about how your, how your hard drive crashes, uh, which has happened to the best of us. I literally just chopped out the one line and repeated it over and over and over again, as you can see right here in, in time. And I pitched each individual one to what I wanted it to be. So as you can see in Studio One, you just go over to the side and you can actually just change the, uh, the tuning. So those are fine, but then it starts to tune down minus five, minus eight, minus 10, all the way down to two full octaves below what it should normally be. And then I just put this through bit crusher that I have keyed in to hit harder and harder and harder over time. <laughs> And everything's just being run out to this distortion section. And I automated the down sampling to come in more and more and more as the sound effect crashes. And then that gives you kind of the whole entire vibe for how I got it all done. That was the steps that I would take to kind of go from just the instruments to building up a mix, drums, guitar, bass, start adding in uh, lead guitars, X guitars, additional instruments, bring up the main vocals, uh, add all the effects to that, bring in the harmonies, and then do any sort of last ditch effects to the entire thing afterwards. And then I print it all down into these major stems right here, which is the instrumental, the lead vocal, and the backup vocals and the effects vocals just kind of there so that I could do the mastering later or send it off to someone who's gonna do mastering. And that's pretty much it for how I would go about mixing a pop punk song. 